Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you again on this Wednesday morning, this virtual Wednesday morning, when we get an opportunity to explore lesson number 22, which is our continuing study of the, uh, the end times and the Great Awakening from 1844 and beyond. Uh, we only have two more sessions to go after this, and I'm hoping that by the time we get through the next few weeks, uh, we'll be able to get back together again. Uh, but if we can't, we will figure out what to do then. Uh, but anyway, there's three ways to interpret Revelation. One is that it already happened in the past, one that it was going to happen in the future, uh, and another was that it happened in Rome, and that John was talking about Rome. This session is about a premillennial perspective that basically um, everyone is awaiting for Christ's return. And the group that started this, which is well documented in Bob's notes, was called the Millerites, who turned into the Adventists the Seventh-day Adventists. And they're called Adventists because they're awaiting, like in Advent, a new beginning, a new start. They believed, and still do believe today, that you can predict when Christ is going to come by looking at the timing of Scripture, particularly in the book of Daniel. Uh, another surprise you may find out is that uh, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, believe in uh, the Trinity, which is what we believe in, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they also the 12th largest denomination in the world. Kind of hard to believe, right? They have 21 million members, okay? They have 86,000 churches, 200 hospitals, over 200 hospitals, and uh, over 9,000 schools. Uh, so they're no small denomination. And many, many times we would look at them and hardly even know about them. Uh, the history of them goes back to a denomination that started in the 1800s, which Bob articulates very well, called the Millerites, who said they could predict exactly when Christ was coming again. Uh, by looking at the book of Daniel and Revelation, uh, and these things are well documented in Bob's notes. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen. And when it didn't happen, they says, well, we have to recalculate. We got it wrong. Uh, to this day, they believe that. They believe that Christ will come again and that there are various signs of the times that point that we're going to have to go through tragedy before Christ comes again. Uh, they, for example, today, if you do a little Googling online, you will see that they view this pandemic as justification for them awaiting for their new advent. So anyway, go take a look at the notes. Again, uh, my offer still stands. I'd love to chat with any of you if you would like to chat. And uh, just give me a call and we can pray together. We can talk about whatever it is you want. Uh, I'll let you know Nina and I are doing fine. Uh, I'm getting kind of tired of doing all of this. And I don't think I ever want to go to another Zoom meeting in my life. But uh, I, I miss all of you guys. And uh, we're still trying to figure out how to carry forward if this thing goes on for any substantial period of time. And unfortunately, I think it's going to go on for a substantial period of time. So stay well. We miss you. Bob and I care tremendously about you and know that we are available to you for whatever you need. God bless each and every one of you. Welcome back to this series on the apocalypse and its sometimes turbulent role in Western history. At this point, we're looking at a major watershed in American perceptions of Revelation. In the last lecture, I noted that in the 18th and early 19th centuries, many Americans linked Revelation to the idea of progress. They thought that Revelation outlined a progressive view of history that would eventually culminate in the great millennial age of peace on earth. 
and they thought they could see progress toward the millennium coming in the success of religious revivals and the efforts to reform society by abolishing slavery. I mentioned that the usual name for this worldview is post-millennialism. The idea is that the millennial age of peace and prosperity comes through progress, and then after that, in the post-millennial period, Christ will return for the resurrection and last judgment. But we saw in the last lecture that in the late 19th century, post-millennialism lost its appeal. The Civil War was over, but life seemed far short of the Golden Age, so the idea that a great millennial period was coming no longer seemed credible. Some people hung on to hope for progress in the church and in society, but they found it best to leave Revelation aside and to focus on texts that seemed more realistic. Now, in this lecture, I want to turn to the other side of the story and focus on those who decided that the movement of history was not positive, but negative. They agreed that there was no reason to think that progress would bring in the millennial age. But instead of dropping the apocalyptic dimension and hanging on to the hope for progress, they hung on to the apocalyptic dimension and abandoned the hope for progress. They continued to believe that the millennial age was coming, but they insisted that it would come through cataclysmic change when Christ returned to establish his kingdom on earth. This general perspective is called pre-millennialism. It insists that the world is not going to get better and better. The assumption is that it will get worse and worse until Christ himself returns before the millennial age or pre the millennial age. From this perspective, the only way the millennial age of peace on earth will come is by direct intervention from God. The result is that those who hold this perspective turn away from reforming society as a whole. Instead, the pre-millennial perspective emphasizes bringing individuals to faith so that they'll be saved when this world ends and the new world begins. At some level, this general approach informs much of the apocalyptic speculation that you find on the internet today. And given its popularity, I want to spend this lecture and the next lecture looking at two different forms that these ideas can take. In this lecture, I want to focus on what is called the Adventist perspective. The word Advent means coming. And the groups that fit this category are the ones that at some point have tried to determine the exact time that Christ's second coming will occur. We've already seen this perspective at work in some of the previous lectures. You remember that some of the radical Franciscans thought the end of the age would come in the year 1260. Then during the Reformation, Melchior Hoffman thought that Christ would return in the year 1533 we'll find that this impulse to determine when the end would come has also played a role in American life. Here I'll begin with William Miller, who convinced thousands of people that Christ would return in 1844. His ideas created a national sensation, and even when things failed to turn out as planned, others followed in his footsteps. The heirs of his movement include groups like the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. In the next lecture, I'll take up what's called the Dispensationalist perspective. I know the word Dispensationalist may seem overly technical, but it refers to the most common form of futuristic interpretation today. It's the perspective held by those who think that at the end of the age, all true Christians will be mysteriously caught up to heaven in an event called the rapture. The belief is that this will save people from the onslaught of the Antichrist. This is also the perspective that generates most of the speculation about how current events in the Middle East might be fulfilling biblical prophecy. So that will be what we take up next time. But for now, let me return to the Adventist perspective. 
I have to confess that the idea that people can or even should try to figure out when the end of the age will come is not an easy thing for me to understand. At a personal level, I really can't imagine decoding biblical passages in order to determine when a new age will begin. And there are certainly plenty of New Testament passages that caution against trying to identify some particular day or hour as the moment of Christ's coming. So, from my perspective, that kind of calculation seems misguided at best, and so far the success rate of those who have tried it has been zero. So, that doesn't give me a great deal of incentive to take these efforts seriously. But what interests me about the Adventist impulse is the human dynamic involved. It's interesting to ask why this line of thinking would appeal to some. And there seem to be a number of factors. In the last lecture, we noted that those who hoped for continuing progress in history eventually came to think of the future as something open. They envisioned a world of continual change, which was moving into a future with no real sense of closure. For them, that lack of closure was appealing. But the Adventists move in the opposite direction. Closure is what they're looking for. They want to know that history has a goal that will be realized through a clear and definite act of God. What's more, they insist that the flow of history is not random. They want to affirm that God is in control, that God has a plan for the flow of history, and that the Bible reveals God's plans so that we can determine where we are in the flow of events leading up to the end. What makes the Adventist impulse distinctive is that some who share it think the Bible not only reveals what God will do, but when God will do it. And that sets up situations of high expectation followed by deep disappointment. This is the part of the story I find most significant. It's interesting to ask what happens when you've created a scenario for your life and your future and nothing turns out as planned. How do you deal with that? That's the question that I take with me as I look to the Adventist approach to Revelation. And as we follow this story, we'll see what kinds of responses people actually did make to the event that became known as the Great Disappointment. Our story begins with a man named William Miller, who in his early life was a deist, now, deists place a high value on rationality. They think it's rational to believe that there is a God, but not a God who gets involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of human beings. What moved Miller away from his early deism was his experience in the War of 1812. He was involved in a battle where he narrowly escaped injury, and he thought that this was a miracle. So he turned to Christianity and began attending a local Baptist church. Yet Miller also wanted to ground his newfound faith more securely and rationally. So he decided to read the Bible from beginning to end. And as he did so, he wanted to harmonize all the apparent contradictions so that he could see the Bible as one coherent whole. During this process, he concluded that the Bible laid out God's plan for history and showed him the time when Christ would return. Now, let me pause here and note how paradoxical this is. For most of us, the idea of trying to determine the specific time of Christ's return doesn't seem logical at all. But from Miller's perspective, this was a highly rational thing to do. He was looking at the data within the Bible and trying to put the pieces together. It was a cognitive exercise. If the 18th century had been the great age of reason, then the 19th century was the era of common sense. And people wanted the facts. So Miller analyzed the data that he found in the Bible and reached his conclusions. That's the paradox. Miller followed a highly rational course of action in order to reach a conclusion that, from our perspective, seems completely illogical. So let me tell you how his system worked. The overall framework was created from the eighth chapter of the book of Daniel. 
That chapter envisioned a time when God's sanctuary would be defiled and then cleansed. Now, you may remember from an earlier lecture that the book of Daniel spoke about a situation in which the sanctuary in Jerusalem had been defiled by the regional ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes. It was a time when the people in authority had tried to suppress traditional Jewish practices, but Miller thought the sanctuary mentioned in Daniel actually signified the earth, since the earth itself had been defiled by sin, and he wondered how long that state of affairs would continue. For him, the key verse was Daniel 8.14. That verse said that after 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Now, for most of us, that bit of information doesn't seem at all to the point, but for Miller, it was. He thought that in biblical prophecy, one day symbolized one year. So if Daniel spoke about 2,300 days, then this symbolized 2,300 years. And you're probably still wondering what this has to do with anything. Well, without going into all the details, Miller thought that Daniel was speaking about an era that began in 457 BC. That's when a Persian king commanded that Jerusalem should be restored. And Jerusalem was where the sanctuary was located. So if the purification of the sanctuary was to take 2,300 days, and if those days symbolized 2,300 years, then Miller concluded that the time would run out in 1843 or 1844. That's really all you need to know. Miller thought that between 1843 and 1844, Christ would return to purify the sanctuary, which symbolized the earth. And that would bring the current period of history to an end with the kingdom of God on earth. Now, let me assure you that there's no final exam in this course. So you're not responsible for keeping track of the calculations. But what I want you to see is what a cognitive exercise this is. And it's also a remarkable combination of literal and symbolic interpretation. Miller takes the number 2300 in a very specific and precise way so that he can use it as the basis for his calculations. But then he shifts to a symbolic mode when he insists that the 2300 days symbolize 2,300 years. So when people tell me that futuristic perspectives rely on a very literal interpretation of the Bible, I have to disagree. When you look at this material, as well as the material we'll consider in the next lecture, you'll find that it's selectively literal. Even the most literalistic interpreters frequently resort to symbolism in their work. You can see the symbolism on the charts that Miller's followers used to outline the flow of history, showing its culmination in 1843. The classic chart uses the beasts from Daniel to symbolize the world empires that came before Christ. For example, Miller thought when Daniel saw a lion with wings, that symbolized the kingdom of Babylon. A bear with tusks, that symbolized the kingdoms of Media and Persia. The winged leopard was the kingdom of Greece, and the ten-horned monster was pagan Rome. Miller also shifted over to Revelation and used those images to symbolize periods of history. Miller initially thought that the great beast with seven heads and ten horns symbolized Rome under the papacy. We've certainly heard that before. But Miller added that the horrific locusts that swarmed out of the abyss in Revelation 9, symbolized the rise of Islamic armies. And when the next part of Revelation 9 showed riders on their horses shooting fire at their enemies, he thought this must symbolize the armies of the Turks. As evidence for this, the chart insists that the Turks were the first ones to use firearms while riding on horses, so all the smoke and fire seemed to fit. In the 1840s, Miller's circle of followers exploded into a widespread popular movement. It's hard for us to imagine this today, but at its height, there were thousands of people directly involved in the movement, and many more who were intrigued by it. Some of these people had tremendous gifts for publicity. They created a newspaper called Signs of the Times in order to publicize their views. Speakers went out on the lecture circuit, and countless pamphlets were printed. 
Interest in Miller's theories intensified, and people began pressing for more clarity on just when he thought the end might come. Miller did some more study, and eventually he narrowed his calculations about the time frame. He concluded that Christ would return sometime between March 21st of 1843 and March 21st of 1844. As the time approached, the movement grew in size, and it had a polarizing effect. Those who belonged to the movement became ever more aggressive in promoting the message. And the more aggressive the Millerites became, the more intense the opposition became. So as the tension mounted, the Millerites came to think that the power of the Antichrist was broader than they had thought at first. They came to see that the beast and the harlot of Revelation were not only symbols of the papacy, as they had thought before. They concluded that these images symbolized all the churches, both Catholic and Protestant, all the churches that opposed the Millerites' message about the end. And this led some of the Millerites to argue that they needed to separate themselves from the wider body of Christians. They took that famous line out of Revelation 18, Come out of her, my people. You remember from our last lecture that some of the radical abolitionists had used that line when urging people to come out and separate themselves from institutions that condoned slavery. Some of the Millerites also used it when calling their members to come out of the churches that did not believe Jesus was coming soon. Well, Miller had originally said that Christ would return sometime within a 12-month period, between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. But that period passed with no sign of the end. So pressure mounted to recalculate, and one of Miller's followers suddenly announced that the true time of Christ's return could be narrowed down to one specific day. October 22nd, 1844. The idea that one could name not only the year, but the day of Christ's return was audacious. And it was so breathtakingly audacious that many believed that it must be true. So the news spread rapidly throughout the movement. People got ready for the end to arrive. And this episode has taken on a legendary quality in American history. In popular imagination, the Millerites went out to the hilltops or even sat on their roofs wearing long white robes and looking up as they waited for Jesus to sweep them away into heaven. But historians have actually found little evidence for this. The classic versions of the scene were actually created by the critics of the movement who thought that all the hype about the end of the world was ridiculous. So they lampooned the Millerites with cartoons and negative editorials. Historically, it seems that most simply gathered in homes or in churches on that faithful day and waited. When nothing happened, the day became known as the Great Disappointment. One of the Millerites who went through it recalled having felt healthy and vigorous when the day began, but as the day passed into darkness and then a new day dawned, he felt weak. Someone helped him to his room where he lay for two days, sick with disappointment. Another one of the Millerites said, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. We wept and wept till the day dawned. For me, this is where the human dimension comes in. In the eyes of many people, Miller seemed to have all the facts in order. He'd lined up the books of Daniel and Revelation in an apocalyptic scenario that made sense to him. But the system failed, and people had to find a way to deal with the great disappointment. So here's where I want to ask what their options were and how the book of Revelation played a role in what happened next. 
We'll find that there were three main responses. One was to reject this approach. A second was to reinterpret it. And a third was to keep recalculating. Now, the first response would seem to be the most obvious. That approach was simply to reject the idea that anyone could use the Bible to determine when the end of the age would come. Those who responded to the great disappointment in this way left the movement and tried to get on with their lives as best they could. The second approach was to reinterpret what had happened. There were some who concluded that Miller had been right about the date of Christ's coming. But he'd been wrong about the mode of his coming. You see, they insisted that Christ really had come to cleanse the sanctuary at the time Miller predicted. But they concluded that Christ must have come to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary and not the earthly one. The idea that there is a heavenly sanctuary appears in the New Testament book of Hebrews, and it's also there in Revelation. In previous lectures, we've noted heavenly scenes where God was enthroned in what seemed to be a sanctuary. But a passage that proved especially helpful for this process of reinterpretation came from Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. That's where it says, The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. This vision of the heavenly temple being opened at a key point in the apocalyptic drama gave Miller's followers a space in which they could point to something new taking place. By drawing on this verse and other New Testament texts, they developed the idea that at the appointed time in 1844, Christ had entered the sanctuary in heaven. So the implication is that when Christ has finished his work there, he'll finally come to earth so it too can be cleansed and the new age can be established. Now, those who responded to the great disappointment by reinterpreting Miller's predictions formed the nucleus of a group that would eventually become the Seventh-day Adventists. And that denomination has millions of members around the globe today. One of their early leaders was Ellen White. What's interesting is that her persuasive power came not so much from rational argument as Miller's did. Rather, it came from her visionary experiences which included apocalyptic motifs. After the Great Disappointment, she reported having a vision in which the group she called the Advent People was traveling toward the New Jerusalem. As the travelers grew weary, they were encouraged on their way by Jesus, so she sensed that she and others were being called forward with the hope that they would reach the holy city that was coming. After she reported on this and other visions, Members of the Adventist circle began to regard her as a kind of prophet, and they used an expression from Revelation 19 to describe her. They said that in her they found, quote, the spirit of prophecy that Revelation had mentioned. As she assumed a leadership role in the movement, she also encouraged the idea that the Sabbath was to be kept on Saturday, which was the seventh day of the week rather than on Sundays in most Christian churches. That distinctive practice gave them the name Seventh-day Adventists. And it's interesting to read some of their early literature where they argue that the general American insistence on observing the Sabbath on Sunday rather than Saturday was what Revelation meant by receiving the mark of the beast. The third response to the great disappointment was to recalculate the time of Christ's return yet again. The assumption was that there was a way to get the calculations right if people only persisted. So some people kept trying. The most famous example of this was Charles Tazzy Russell. He began to publish a paper called Zion's Watchtower to express his views. And along with it, he formed a group called Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. This is the group we know today as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Russell himself was born a few years after the Great Disappointment, but 
He was intrigued with the idea of determining when the end would come. In his younger years, some people were speculating that the end might come in 1874. But again, the year came and went without any cataclysmic change. So Russell began thinking that Christ must have returned spiritually in that year, which according to his new theory marked the beginning of the period that he called the Millennial Dawn. And it was a transitional period that he thought would end in 1914 with the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. I won't go through all the calculations that led up to this, but a few observations may be helpful. Sometimes when people encounter groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they assume that their beliefs are based mainly on revelation. But actually their beliefs reflect a theological system that's created by combining various verses of the Bible like pieces of a puzzle. For someone like Russell, a key verse actually came from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. It was a verse that spoke of Jerusalem being trampled down until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. Russell combined this with verses from the plague scenes in Revelation 16 and pictured a spiritual battle in which the false religious influences that now dominated the churches were being overthrown. And in time, he expected it all to culminate in the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the present age. A special feature of Russell's work was his interest in Revelation's vision of 144,000 people who seemed to play a key role in the apocalyptic drama. In Revelation itself, these people came from the 12 tribes of Israel and they eventually appear with Jesus the Lamb on Mount Zion. In the original literary context, the number is simply a way of talking about the community of faith as a whole. But Russell thought the number was to be taken literally as a specific number of people who would one day rule spiritually with Christ in heaven as priests and kings. In the early years of the movement, its members thought that the 144,000 were being gathered right then in anticipation of the end. Of course, as the membership of the core group became larger than 144,000, they had to change the focus and to give greater attention to Revelation's visions of a countless multitude finding life in the presence of God. So that gave assurance that all their members would have some kind of a place in the new age. Well, you can imagine that there was considerable excitement when 1914 finally arrived and World War I broke out. It seemed like it might really be the year of the biblical Armageddon. But again, history refused to cooperate. Despite all the carnage on the battlefield, the New Age failed to arrive. Russell's successor tried recalculating again, and he announced that the resurrection of the dead would occur in 1925. He publicized this with the famous slogan that millions now living will never die because the end was so close. But again, the year came and went and with it, many left the movement. Those who stayed had to become more circumspect about how close the end might be. So it seems like things have come full circle. The Adventist impulse was looking for a sense of closure in knowing that the present age was soon going to end. But closure is precisely what proved to be so elusive. And the groups that came out of the times of disappointment may have reinterpreted what had happened, or they may have tried recalculating the time that the end would come. But finally, they could only survive by living with a sense of ambiguity. They had to return to the idea that there would be an end someday, but just when that would be remained an open question. In the next lecture, we'll continue our look at the modern futuristic perspectives by turning to the one that is by far the most influential today, 
It's the one that shapes debates about things like the rapture, Armageddon, and politics in the Middle East. That perspective is what people ask me about more than anything else we've discussed in this course. Those who formed it have generally refrained from setting a date for the end and yet are able to convey a sense that the end could come at any time. Learning to understand what this perspective is and how it works is a key to understanding much of the apocalyptic discourse that goes on in modern American culture. I hope that you'll join me.